Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, getting up and awake and in here this morning. This is a great turnout. I am, and welcome to Portland, for those of you who haven't been here before. <laughs> so I'm Greg Lanche. I am the track chair for the Nonprofit Government and Education Track. Um, and so I am really excited to see this many people in here today. This is, this is fantastic. So um, I'm here, I'm going to introduce uh, my friend Paul Lieberman here. He is the uh, lead developer and Drupal architect. Did I get that right, Paul? Sure. Okay, good. <laughs> um, at Oregon State University, and um, he's been doing web stuff um, since, well, as long as there's been a web um, as a sysadmin and as a developer. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Paul and let him get started because he's much more interesting than I am. So thank you, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to DrupalCon. Welcome to Portland. I want to thank Greg for the introduction and also for his work and the uh, Drupal Association's work in setting up this new track for government, uh, nonprofit, and education. Uh, a lot of us in education have been coming to DrupalCon and attending BOFs, and, and uh, there will be quite a few of those happening here. I tend, uh, encourage you to attend. But it's really nice to have this track uh, for the first time dedicated to uh, those of us in the public sector uh, to have an opportunity to uh, share some of the things we're doing. How's the volume back there? Okay, thank you. So uh, you might have, um, people are pointing to me. Yes, Paul's going. Okay, I'm not in slideshow mode. I'm not sure how that happened. I thought I said do a slideshow. Okay, that's better. So as you might have gathered from Greg's introduction, I've been uh, doing this for quite a while. And I'm actually, I'm actually older than Dries. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can tell, but, <laughs> uh, but I've been around long enough to know that Dries didn't actually invent the web. The web was around before him. What, uh, what Dries brought to the table and Drupal brought to the table is a way for us to manage uh, very large websites uh, in, in, in a sane manner. Before that, it really was uh, chaos. Uh, some of you that have been in education for a while might uh, remember what it was like. It took some institutions about 10 years just to convince the art department and the science department that they should use the same colors. And that maybe we should use the same, uh, our school colors and use a, a common theme for the, uh, for the whole university. That, that was a struggle. And fortunately, uh, we're beyond most of that now. And with Drupal, we have um, the tools to really move uh, forward into a much, uh, much, you know, much better way of doing it. So um, speaking of school colors, uh, that's our, our Drupal mascot there. <laughs> Oregon State, we're the beavers. And so uh, we may be uh, violating the Drupal Association uh, branding guidelines by using our color for the Drupal drop, but, uh, but there it is. And I want to apologize to the other OSU if there are any Buckeyes in the audience. When I say OSU, I'm not talking about Ohio State, I'm talking about Oregon State. Uh, we are the beavers. I work for Central Web Services at Oregon State University. We provide Drupal hosting and custom application development. And I have uh, with me today Cher Fenn and some of my other coworkers. Cher does all of our Drupal training and user support, and she's going to help with the questions uh, that we'll have at the end. I'm not going to stop her questions during the presentation. I'm going to uh, just save those for the end. Uh, also, at Oregon State University, I want to mention we host the, um, <clears throat> the open source lab. Uh, these uh, open source lab have been doing uh, wonderful stuff in the open source world for quite a few years. They host the uh, uh, Mozilla uh, Foundation, the uh, Apache uh, Foundation, and uh, this other little group called uh, Drupal.org. So uh, the Drupal.org servers 
are right down in our server room, right next to uh, the servers that run our website. It's kind of a nice arrangement for us. So, um, and, well, and uh, the open source people are putting on uh, quite a few presentations here at DrupalCon. Uh, some of them are in the DevOps track. One of them is right after this one, so I would encourage you, if you're interested in any of that, to, to uh, attend those sessions as well. So what we're going to talk about today is how OSU has been successful in uh, deploying and managing Drupal. Uh, a lot of our websites run on Drupal, not all of them, but uh, certainly the majority. So you know, I think we've done quite well at it. And, uh, but not everything you know, has, is really the best way to be doing things. We found things that worked. I'm going to talk about those things, and then I'm going to talk about how we would like to be able to be doing some of it differently. I'll, we'll talk about what we're currently walking, working on, and then uh, some of the stuff we'll be looking at or that we have in uh, development for the future. Um, it's supposed to be a technical session. We're going to look at uh, some snapshots of some code snippets. I'm not going to get into any detail on the code. But all of the code is available for download, uh, following the links on the um, resources at the end of the slides. So you'll be able to get the code, take a look at it in depth. Today, I'm just mostly going to skim over it pretty quickly, because we don't have time to really dive into that kind of stuff. So um, we've done a lot of things right <clears throat> that have allowed us to scale. Uh, what we've done is we've basically scaled, I guess you could say scaled outward. We have a lot of Drupal sites, a lot of individual Drupal sites. Some of them are quite large, but we've mostly scaled by being able to support a large number of sites rather than uh, put our emphasis on scaling uh, a few really large sites, although we're working on that now. So in a lot of ways, we've been a victim of our own success in that uh, it's been too easy just to create new Drupal sites whenever somebody wants them. And eventually, that catches up to you, becomes more of a management uh, nightmare. And um, <clears throat> so some of the things we provide at Central Web, besides the training, we can do the site installs and the updates, automated uh, backup, database backup. Uh, we provide the, uh, the support for Drupal. And that's here are the numbers once again. Uh, this, this, this isn't really meaningful in the sense that this is, you know, great, we have this many Drupal sites. We have this many Drupal sites. Uh, we can support this many Drupal sites, keep them updated, keep them secure, but we really don't want this many Drupal sites. We, we <laughs> got there because we created a system that supported that, and it worked really well. Uh, and people wanted that. Everybody comes, I want a Drupal site. Sure, here's a Drupal site. We, now we have to start having the conversation, well, aren't you really part of this other Drupal site over there? We're just beginning to, to look at that kind of thing. Um, we, we collaborate within the university. Um, a lot of the colleges host their own infrastructure, but they run our distribution of Drupal. We communicate with our marketing, excuse me, we collaborate with our marketing and web communications team. Uh, they have designers, and we have developers, so we build the themes in conjunction with them. And we have gotten it to where we have just a couple of very uh, of standard themes that have our branding and that we're using across the whole uh, Drupal environment. So we put together an application to uh, manage this thing. We, we call it Web Manage. Uh, it was written many years ago. I wasn't uh, involved. Uh, it was written in uh, an older version of, uh, of Ruby on Rails. And what it does is it lets us manage basically the departments. We call them the site owners and the authors. And uh, it creates the Apache vhost configuration, sets up the distribution directory, sets up file permissions on the like sites default files or sites files, um, <clears throat> handles the database creation, and, uh, and removable and remove sites, and handles the uh, Drupal installs and, bucks and bulk site updates. Now, we've talked 
Uh, this app is getting kind of old, and you know, we talked about should we put our development effort into maintaining this, improving it, making it better, having it do all the things we would like it to do, and we decided against that that this was an in-house uh, application that suited our needs or wasn't the kind of thing that was going to really uh, work for a much larger audience. And so we're, we decided to shelve this thing and let's put our development effort into a community project. And uh, so that's where we're uh, looking to go with it right now. So. If you've um, set up Drupal multi-site, for um, you're familiar with this with this picture here. Basically, with Drupal multi-site, you create a Drupal directory. That's where your core files are. You'll have a sites all. That's where your shared modules and uh, themes will go. And then every site has a sites directory under under the sites directory. So in this picture, I've got site one, site two. And they all have, uh, if they have custom uh, modules or themes, and their files, I don't show that in this picture, all go in those directories. That's the standard uh, Drupal multi-site uh, directory structure. Um, it works. It works best if you have uh, subdomains, like in this example, site1.college.edu, site2.college.edu. It does not work as well if you have subdirectories. Uh, like college.edu slash site one slash site two. You can make it work. It involves creating some sim links out at the, uh, at the root of your uh, uh, Drupal files. So it's, uh, it's limited in how well it scales. Uh, from, from my experience, anyhow, I'm sure some people have, have made it scale quite large. But um, we found a different way of doing it, which is we have one instance of the Drupal core files and the uh, sites all that we then symlink to the sites directory, which, which can be anywhere. So we're not, we don't have to create the sites directory under uh, Drupal core sites. We create them anywhere in our web tree and we symlink to the Drupal core files. So each Drupal site thinks it's its own Drupal site and just uses sites default for its files and its settings. And um, the thing about this is it scales quite well. When I first saw it, I, I kind of scoffed at it and said, well, this, this is wrong. This isn't the way Drupal multi-site works. But over, uh, over time, this has proven to be a, um, a, a you know, reliable and very scalable architecture. Uh, so the advantage is, one of the advantages is you can place these sites anywhere in the web tree. You can nest them. So I can create a Drupal site under a Drupal site or under a non-Drupal site. Um, that's the advantage. And it's also the disadvantage. <laughs> because once you start doing that, you've kind of got worked yourself into a little hole where you've got stuff all over the place. It's hard to keep track of where it is and it becomes difficult to manage. Uh, nevertheless, that's still what we're doing and it's still working uh, quite well for us. So this is just a, a screenshot of the directory list where you can see that these are sim links. That's what the little uh, right arrow next to the file names are. And the call out is showing that we use a, a just a, a standard uh, build number uh, for our distribution. So we'll have uh, our core files in a directory that will use a, uh, the Drupal version number and then a build number. And then you know, the next release, we just create another directory with an updated um, build number. We try and uh, push out new releases every six to eight weeks, uh, depending on whether there's uh, security updates or you know, modules, uh, update, important module updates. Uh, or custom work that we've done that we want to get out there. That's slowing down for the Drupal 6. It's been kind of hectic for Drupal 7. There's been a lot of version updates in the last few months that we've tried to keep, uh, keep up with. So the, um, the Web Manage application, as I mentioned, was, is a Ruby on Rails app, but it actually kicks off a Python script that uh, installs Drupal. And um, 
So the script does these things up here. Uh, basically creates a directory, wherever it is, symlinks in all the Drupal files, uh, creates the sites all and the sites default directory, sets all the permissions, and then runs Drush. So this is the first I've mentioned Drush. That what you're going to be hearing a lot of through the rest of uh, this presentation is using Drush for these kinds of things because Drush is the tool. If you want to automate Drupal, uh, Drush is is, is your friend. It's the best way to do it. I don't see how we would be doing this at all if it wasn't uh, for Drush. So if you see uh, most Weitzman today, shake his hand, thank him. Uh, Drush is, is really the way to go for doing uh, Drupal backend stuff. Here's a, just a snapshot of the um, install script that's uh, calling the Drush uh, site install command with a bunch of options. If you look down on the on the white on the bottom there, I'm showing you the help uh, Drush help site install uh, to really get these options. This is just the, the script is just showing how I'm passing them into the command, uh, and you know, it doesn't have to be Python. You can do this in PHP or your language of choice. It could be just a shell script uh, for creating sites using Drush site install. So uh, don't ask me why, but after the uh, Python script is done creating the Drupal site, the next thing that happens is a PHP script. Now, you know, so we, we got people that are good in all these different languages, so, you know, whatever language you want to use, depends who's writing it, I guess. But this one uses uh, Drush uh, user create and Drush uh, add uh, role. I guess you can't see the, the add role in there. Uh, user ad role, but basically um, you can use uh, Drush to create the user. So we're automating that so when a new site goes out, we've got the list of users from our web managed program and whether their role should be, uh, there's a couple of different roles. So we automate that so a new site goes out with the users already installed. So after, uh, well, before the add user, after, during the install, uh, it invokes our install profile. And we spent a lot of time working on a install profile, as I'm sure uh, most of you have. We just use, you know, a single install profile for all of our, of our um, entire distribution. It's flexible enough that it can be used for different purposes, administrative sites, academic sites, uh, uh, student groups uh, can all use the same install profile. We worked hard in making it uh, more modular. When I first started working on it, it was just a long monolithic uh, string of uh, you know database inserts and set commands, and um, we modularized that quite a bit. We're also working on uh, now making sites go out with some default content. Uh, it used to be that uh, sites went out, they were bare bones. If you didn't take Shares class and learn how to create content types and views, you didn't get much. Our new sites now are going out with, um, uh, you know, just kind of a default content, and they can just go in there and edit that content, change it to their own. So they get a lot of the features uh, without having to know how to create them. And we're doing that in the install profile. So. Um, one of the things that I learned at a DrupalCon training last year, I'm trying to see if I have, um, I, d I don't see the link to it, but it's in the resources, which was on how to use figure, uh, features for your configuration. So in other words, uh, right now you might have an install profile where everything, all your permissions, uh, each module configuration is just in a long list of stuff to do. But you can break that stuff out and actually create modules for it using features. And you can export your configuration, save that as code uh, with a feature. You can, change, you can work on that feature, turn it into a module to do even more stuff. And this is an excellent way to simplify your install profile and start delivering your functionality through modules uh, rather than just uh, 
a, a straight uh, install profile. So as an example here, uh, a user role. So most uh, sites are going to have some sort of a author or an editor role, people to go in and create content in Drupal. And they need certain things in order to do that. You'll have to have those text filters defined. Is it a, uh, a filtered HTML, full HTML filter? Maybe you have some custom stuff you put in those filters. Uh, you're probably setting up one of the WYSIWYG editors, uh, CK editor, tiny MCE, so that they have a word processor like environment, word processor like environment to work in. And those have uh, those profiles associated with them. And finally, the permissions. So we created a feature out of that. This is just a snapshot of part of the .info file where you can list your dependencies. Say, you know, I need those modules, and I'm going to uh, define these filters and, uh, and this role within this module. And so at install time, you just list that module as one of the modules to be installed, and, and you get that configuration. So we've done this for our various roles, uh, for uh, various uh, parts of the system that we wanted to be able to pull that configuration out and snapshot it as a module rather than just something you have to go in and configure after. Uh, this is just another snapshot of the um, install tasks within your uh, profile and your install profile. You can break it down. What we found is that, or what I found because I stumbled on this numerous times, um, if you're configuring your permissions in your um, installed profile, do it after you've got everything installed. If you try and configure permissions and the correct module is not instantiated yet, it throws all kinds of errors. So basically we do the configure, which gets everything installed and configured. We set the permissions, and then we build some default content. So uh, you install Drupal, you got updated. Happens uh, a lot. Uh, we get uh, security patches come out, some updates to modules that you gotta have. And the process for doing that you know, if you did it on an individual site, you'd have to run update PHP, take the site offline, do the whole thing. Uh, Dresh can do all that for you. And so uh, we can do it in batch mode. We can't just automate, say, do them all, because we've got to go through this web interface, select the ones we want to update, submit them to be updated. So it's basically, I can select a couple of screenfuls at a time, uh, send them through, and then I can monitor the, the process, progress and, um, and then do that until they're all done. So the update script will back up the database, put the site in maintenance mode, creates those symlinks, and remember we're using symlinks, so all we gotta do is break the old symlinks, symlink into the new files, and that, you know, that updates our files, uh, Drupal core or contributed modules. Uh, run the uh, database update, put the site back online, clear the cache, away we go. And, um, and we do it with Drush. So uh, I've uh, circled all the relevant commands here that we can use. We use SQL dump to do a database backup. Uh, <clears throat> you can set the site offline, run the update DB, uh, set it back online, clear the cache, and away we go, all with Drush commands. Cron is something that uh, you need to run on your sites, and we run cron with cron. Makes sense. Uh, that's Unix cron, so uh, most of our websites run on Unix type systems, Linux, whatever, which has this built in cron facility. And that's the reason they call it Drupal cron, they call it cron and Drupal uh, because of that. But um, <clears throat> there's a, a link up here for uh, the best documentation I found, and I, I'm pretty sure uh, Moshe Weitzman wrote it on running uh, cron, running Drupal cron from within the Unix cron. Uh, we, we basically do it twice a day. There's some sites that need it more than that. Uh, if you're aggregating a lot of content using the aggregator, you might want to run it more frequently. Uh, that's a limitation of our system right now is we can pretty much only do it twice a day. 
we'd like to get to where we can be a little more flexible with that in the future. Once again, it's, it's being kicked off from a Python script that loops through, finds each site that needs to be run, and runs uh, Drush to execute it. So if you've got a lot of sites, you've got to worry about how you've, your, your front end uh, is scaled out to be able to handle it. And so uh, this took a while to get this all in place, but this is what we have now. Uh, we have a Citrix net scaler sitting out in front of everything, and that's a load balancer. And uh, it can basically uh, hand off uh, the requests to one of many web servers that we have out there, eight actually, uh, so that not any one of them is overloaded. Each one of those web servers is running uh, the APC, alternative PHP cache, so that all the uh, PHP opcodes are pre-compiled, ready to go on the web servers themselves. We have one web server that's dedicated just for search engine requests. So you know, if you're a search engine, you go over there, leave us alone over here, and that way search engines don't impact regular user uh, browsing. And we're using memcache. We have dedicated servers uh, just running the memcache to handle most of the Drupal caching. Here's a picture of it. Um, you can see off to the right there, we got the one server that just is doing the uh, search engine, seven others that are available for uh, regular web browsing. And um, the utilization on those seven is quite low. That's the way we like it. <laughs> uh, we're, we're prepared to, you know, for, uh, for spikes in traffic. Uh, you know, if, if they come along, most of these servers are running at pretty low utilization, so we, we, can, we can handle that. And underneath are the shared resources. We've got uh, MySQL that uh, is not just for Drupal. We've got a lot of other applications hitting those MySQL servers, uh, running in a master-slave relationship because you've only got one MySQL server that can handle getting rights. Uh, the other is just available if need be. Uh, and we also, our shared file system is running on NFS. Uh, a lot of limitations to that. Nevertheless, if you are running uh, multiple web heads, you have to have a shared file system. So it's most commonly done with NFS, although we're all looking for better ways of doing it. So managing our distribution uh, for all uh, Drupal 6's uh, lifespan and uh, Drupal 5 before that, uh, we had it all set up using Subversion, SVN, and we could pull from that anytime we had a new distribution to go out. Um, <clears throat> we kept the entire distribution in SVN. Drupal Core contributed everything. Uh, when we went to Drupal 7, I looked at that and said, you know, that's, that's pretty much a waste to, to keep all that stuff in our, in our Git repository. We're using Git for Drupal 7. And I said, I can, use, I can have a Drush make file that'll go out and get Drupal core and the contributed modules uh, and the libraries from their native uh, repositories. I don't have to have copies of them in my repository. So basically then our Git repository just uh, can contain our custom uh, modules and themes and, uh, you know, the stuff that we've modified. Uh, patch files, if we have any patches that, to go against any of the uh, contributed modules, that kind of thing. We're using uh, uh, GitLab. Uh, provides a nice web front end, uh, kind of like GitHub, a little different, uh, but that's what we use internally. So uh, Drush Make is um, a wonderful tool that, whoops, that was what I was afraid of. Sorry, here we are. Um, that lets you basically list everything that's going into your distribution. Drupal core, each module, what version of each module, uh, the libraries, where you want to get them from, where you want them to go. So one of the things that, uh, that we do in our Drush make file is we version everything. So I'll have a Drush make file, say core 7.22, and then for each module, 
I'll list the version, the specific version. So I'm not necessarily getting the latest version. I'm getting the specific version I asked for. And one of the, th the things about that is that's in a snapshot. If you want documentation, what's in my distribution, look at our make file. It lists exactly what versions of what contributed modules, themes, and libraries um, are included. And then we can generate a new make file for each release. I put those files in with the release so you know anybody can grab them um, <clears throat> and uh, link into our distribution. So we're doing those things, we're doing them well. Uh, here's some of the things that, that, you know, that, that we'd like to do better, some of our opportunities. Uh, one of the problems for us is our shared infrastructure. I'm gonna go into a little more detail. This just uh, itemizes these. I'm gonna jump into some of these in a little more detail. Uh, the system we've created uh, leaves us with a lot of administrative overhead. We'd like to automate a lot more stuff than we've got automated now. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, sites that went out with no content uh, w was a big learning curve for our users. We want to we want to be able to release, uh, you know, cr create Drupal sites for people that they can just hit the ground running, go right in. There's content already there. They just have to massage it. Then you know, then it's tailored, make it more tailored for the types of sites that they're building. We still have work to do in that, uh, in that direction. Uh, the whole uh, site life cycle process, you create a site in development, you get it ready to go, you push it out to staging. Uh, it, it looks all good, you've proven it, you, you put it in production. We found that that's a fairly consistent life cycle. Even with Drupal as a content management system, when people are in production, yes, they're adding content and they're working on their content, but at some point, it, they say, you know what, we want to switch to the new theme. Uh, you know, we, you guys released an updated theme, we're still on the old one, and so we'll want to take that site, put it back in development for them, and uh, they'll install a new theme, make the changes, and then they'll, you know, once again, stage it, push it to production. That's a manual process for us right now. And uh, so we want to automate that process. Well, I've got some ideas. We'll show you how, how to do that. Updates, although they're mostly automatic, automated, they do take a long time, and they're not hands off. And currently, we have no cleanup. We have no automated site removal. We have one guy that works for us. I give him lists, you know, I run some queries and I find sites nobody's logged into for a year or so. And, you know, he spends like half his day out there just manually deleting old uh, unused sites. So we've got to automate that. We've got to make it so we can clean up the sites people aren't using. Here's a picture of the shared infrastructure, what, what that looks like. So basically, the problem with that is that the web server, we've got you know, one set of web servers, they're running the home page, they're running Drupal sites, WordPress sites, we have old static HTML sites, some old PHP sites, some PHP applications, uh, other CMSs that are out there, uh, all running on the same web servers. Well, what that means is those web servers have to be configured to the lowest common denominator. I can't put the latest versions of PHP on those servers or uh, any of the, of the other uh, things that, that are used. Uh, our web servers are running PHP 5.2 something because of some legacy applications we have out there. Uh, you know, so basically that means I can't optimize the servers for any of these things. And the other thing about a shared environment, as you all know, if you have one app somewhere out there that starts mis misbehaving, it can, you know, it can take down the whole thing. So where we want to go with that is to start creating more dedicated infrastructure. Let's, let's set up web heads that are just for Drupal. And we can optimize those for Drupal. And we're not going to run anything else on there but Drupal. You have static pages you want to serve up, great. They go on another server. We can play around with uh, rewrite rules and load balancer configuration in order to get the URLs to work out the way you want, but we're not going to run mixed content on these servers. 
So we'll dedicate uh, some infrastructure just for the homepage. Everybody's got to see the homepage. That's got to be up there all the time. We got to make sure that's really super high availability. We'll dedicate infrastructure to that. Same for our other services. We have a lot of custom applications. They each need to be optimized uh, in a certain way. So um, we're working in that direction now. We're already doing it for the applications. We're getting ready to do it for WordPress, and we will be doing it for Drupal 7 very shortly. So the things that we have in progress right now, uh, we're consolidating Drupal 6 sites into Drupal 7 sites. So we, we showed you earlier that uh, you know, we had these big numbers. We have a lot of Drupal 6 sites, too many. Our strategy is that we're going to start consolidating sites uh, as appropriate into Drupal 7. I've got another slide on that in just a minute. The dedicated infrastructure we just looked at. We're going to be phasing out the old web managed program and putting more and more emphasis on Agar. And mostly we're leveraging the Agar backend, which is the provision module. And I'm going to show you some examples of that here in just a minute. So the site consolidation, uh, you know, if you have too many Drupal sites, this is what we found. It leads to unnecessary administrative overhead. You can't share data easily between the sites. Maybe there, you have two departments within a college. They really do want to share data, maybe a directory, some other things, a class listing, but they can't do it. They're different Drupal sites. Sure, they, there's ways of doing it with feeds and whatnot, but uh, they're not doing that now. If they were on one site, it wouldn't be a problem. And then the disjointed navigation. If you're going to college and you're drilling down to departments and they're all on their own websites, uh, it's very hard to have a uh, fluid navigation back and forth. So we're using organic groups uh, to handle basically taking a Drupal 7 site and segmenting it off so that uh, we're maintaining uh, permissions for users to edit their sections of a site uh, and to be able to have some individuality for the sites that we're consolidating. Here's what it looks like. Uh, in Drupal 6, we've got individual Drupal sites at the college level, the school level, department level. You can get to a lot of them. Drupal 7, one site. Uh, so with organic groups, uh, we're, we're like, we're still having to maintain, I mean, one of the main reasons people wanted their own sites is because they don't trust anybody who's going to come in and edit their content and trash their site, right? So, you know, we've got to maintain those permissions so that if I'm working in one area and somebody else is working in another, I know that I can partition that off so that we're not, uh, there's no possibility of us uh, trouncing each other's files. So we can do that with organic groups. We can also give departments some distinctiveness in how the pages look. Uh, you can do that with organic groups. And it makes it much easier to share resources between the whole, um, the whole site. Uh, so we've been working uh, very, very steadily on this for quite some months. Cher has been uh, mostly involved with getting all this organic group configuration together. Ask her if you've got any questions on that later. Uh, oh, and it's not, ju I just want to point out, it's not just, uh, you know, this architecture fits administrative sites that well. We have a lot of administrative sites that really are part of bigger parent units that can be consolidated, and we're working on that. So this is what the uh, back end looks like. I built all of this in development. This is the model for the infrastructure that will be uh, rolling out this summer, uh, hopefully into production. Uh, basically, we still have a load balancer at the front end, but that load balancer currently is doing a lot of the front end caching, uh, you know, static content. It's going to be doing less and less of that. And we're going to need to have that varnish um, <clears throat> second layer in there, which will be handling most of the front end caching and routing. Uh, if you've used varnish, you know it's, it does an excellent job for that. And then uh, leveraging the Agar, what they call a server pack. Uh, they used to call it a cluster. They came out with a new way of doing it. They couldn't call it cluster anymore. It's really a cluster. They call it a server pack. 
Um, and I'm, in my example, I'm just showing two servers each, but that's completely scalable, however many servers you need. So we'll, we'll isolate those off uh, so that different domains, uh, different segments of our, of our website uh, are within their own server packs. And uh, there's still the shared resources of the MySQL database, the file system, and the memcast servers. But on the top there, the way we manage this now is, you know, Agar provides a web front end. You can go in there, you can create sites, you can migrate your sites, uh, you can manage them pretty well. But really, we want to get away from that. We want to be able to automate more of it. And the way you do that is uh, using Drush with the provision module. And if you want to automate that a step further, you can use Fabric to do that. And I will, I think I have a slide here to talk about that. Um, fabric is basically a way that you can leverage uh, SSH to run remote commands on another server. The scripts are written in Python, but basically, all you're doing is doing stuff on the remote server uh, using, uh, using stuff that's on that server. In this case, Drush and Provision. Provision is the Agar back end. Uh, I should point out that basically Agar is two parts. One part they call Hostmaster is the front end. That's the web, that's the, web the Drupal website uh, that allows you to do things through, through the web interface, but the back end is called provision. And provision is completely exposed to Drush. You can do pretty much anything that Agar can do using Drush and provision together. And MIG5, who is uh, one of the developers for, A for the Agar project, uh, has written up some incredible work on, on how to do all this stuff. I've got a link here. It's also in the back. He is uh, zero touch deployment. You can uh, you can uh, Google that and take a look at this stuff. It's it's done very well. Um, <clears throat> some of his code looks like this. This is my code, but it's very similar. This is uh, basically a little snapshot of a uh, fabric script. Uh, but the, the important parts in there are what's in the run statements, which are just Drush commands, provision save, provision install. Uh, basically, that is um, how you do it. Um, the, uh, yeah, so I've got the help on the bottom there. Uh, if you filter on provision Drush, uh, dash dash filter equal provision, you can see all of the commands that are available to you. Uh, there's not, uh, the documentation isn't the greatest, but once you dive into it, uh, this stuff starts uh, making sense. And uh, you can use this to automate your infrastructure like uh, this, is, this is the cutting edge for it. Um, we've also uh, developed uh, some puppet modules for getting our servers installed. Uh, that picture I showed you a few minutes ago, there are quite a few servers on there. And uh, so um, <clears throat> we've uh, developed puppet modules that will do all these things listed up here. So the main thing with Agar is that there's a lot of different roles. You may have a web server, database server, the front end server. Uh, so uh, the puppet, modules to define classes for each one of those different roles. So you just tell it which one you want. That code is available in the resources here. We're looking at continuous integration. If you've worked with that, normally you're talking about the development process. But in this picture, I'm showing you how you could be doing this with Drupal itself because Drush is it can tell you when your when your distribution's out of date. If there are updates to core, updates to modules, and this thing, you can use that uh, in a, continu a continuous integration uh, scheme to create a new release, to create a new Drush make file, bring that down, run your tests on it, and then eventually get it uh, into into production. So looking ahead, 
We're looking at uh, how to do more self-service. People need Drupal sites, give them a console, they can come get the Drupal sites. Uh, how do we, we create a lot of training and development sites. We need to be able to auto-expire and delete those. We built a control panel within a Drupal site to let you move your site from development to production to staging. You don't have to call us to do that. It's in development, not out there yet, but it looks very promising. I'm going to rush through this stuff. I want to just show you an example of uh, using Drush and the provision module uh, to be able to uh, expire and remove sites. It's all there. You can back them up. You can delete them. You can restore them if you have to. Delete the backups when you're finally done with them. This is just uh, within Drupal what that control panel looks like. It knows what your site, the current environment. So this site says, uh, says uh, copy site to staging, so it knows I'm a development site. I can only copy it to staging. If I was a staging site, it could only copy it to production. Built into the Drupal, people can do it themselves right from their own uh, Drupal administrative pages. It naturally backs everything up. There's options in here for them to man manage their backups and restores themselves. Time is running short here, so I'm going to uh, skip. There's not much here. Basically, what that, the back end of that control panel does is allows, you know, using Drush provision clone to clone the sites to, uh, to the new environment. It's pretty straightforward once you start working with Drush provision. So that was what I have to say about um, the things we've done at Central Web Services at Oregon State University. Uh, the thing that's really made us successful at the university is the people that we've got working on Drupal uh, within Central Web and within the entire organization. So if you guys are a part, anybody that's part of OSU Drupal team, wave your hand, stand up, take a bow. They're mostly up front here, but I see a few all over the place. And, uh, and then the Drupal community, all of you, have contributed into our success. So uh, I want to thank you very much. And I've got the resources here. You can download the, uh, the slides from the link in the uh, schedule. And you can, you can link to all this code here. And we're ready for questions. We have a microphone. Uh, follow Greg up there. You can line up with the microphone. Even with the microphone, I'm probably not going to hear you. But I've got a chair up here to help with, uh, with that problem. Uh, <clears throat> my name is John Pugh, I'm with ThinkDrop, and I guess it's a comment, but we've been using Agar for years, and we built a new tool that lets you make a make Agar platforms and sites from Git repos uh, called DevShop, so it kind of allows you to fire up environments really quickly based on that Git URL, uh, and has like, kind of similar to that, cause tools to copy between sites, uh, things to click to pull code to different sites, and uh, integrates with uh, post receive callbacks with GitHub so it keeps the dev sites up to date and things like that. And I just wanted to point it out. And we're having a boff on Wednesday. And it's called Dev Shop. Dev Shop, yes, yes. Thank you for that. Dev Shop is, is a Agar tool. I've seen it. And um, that's, that is that's excellent. Great. Uh, I'd love to tool talk to you more about it. doing some of this kind of stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Do you guys? provide any um, editorial workflow tools for your um, for your site users, like something like revision moderation in Drupal 6 or Workbench in Drupal 7? We're just getting started. Since with the organic groups uh, set up, what we've got now is when you log into the site, if you're a member of the site, uh, it, get, it takes you automatically to the uh, groups dashboard. And you'll see a list of the content you're working on. What we haven't yet uh, worked in is some of those workbench features that you're talking about. Uh, we're looking into doing that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to ask if you had looked at all at Agar version 2 at all. I think they have an alpha release right now. So Agar right now is at version 1.9. 2.0 uh, uh, dev is out. And 3.0 dev is out. 2.0 dev 
is still written to run on Drupal 6. 3.0 dev is written to run on Drupal 7. Uh, and they're both pretty much at the same uh, level. They're, I think they're trying to keep them pretty well parallel. Um, I've worked with both of them. Uh, they're still not complete. Uh, there's work to be done, and um, you know I, I'm hoping to meet up with some of the Agar team here at DrupalCon <laughs> and see what we can do to help because we really want to get that that release out the door. It, cool. We need you it. both. Thanks. Hi. How how do you determine if a hit comes in from a search engine or from a real user? Is that based on a match against the user agent string or anything trickier than that? Can you repeat that question, please? How do you determine if a hit comes in from a search engine or from a real user to route to oh, your one uh, web head? Oh, from the search engines? Yeah, the, the, the uh, load balancer can look at the header and you know, determine where it's coming from. So you know, it, it recognizes search engines. Search engines introduce themselves pretty well. Just by user agent string? Uh, I, I, I think so. I'm not 100% yeah. sure, but built in I, magic I know that for the, your yeah. Excuse me? That built-in magic that your load balancer just does? It can be configured to do so, yes. Okay. Thanks. Hi, Tyler Strike from University of Waterloo. When you create websites, do you create them as subdomains or are they part of your main domain? Either way, and, and that's one of the flexibilities of the system we're using now. We can easily create them as subdirectory sites, but uh, if we uh, need to create them as domains, we can spin off a, a virtual Apache vhost to handle that domain and, uh, and do that as well. So we have a mix of them, and right now it doesn't matter. We can do it either way. We're trying to move more towards the domain, though. Hi, uh, Alex Show from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. I noticed that you did not touch on upgrading uh, D6 to D7. Do you provide upgrade support for your sites? And I did. I, I did go over upgrade. I'm sorry if I, I went through it a little quickly. But yes, it, it, the upgrades happen. Uh, the, there was a, if you look through the slides again, there's a Python script that's got a lot of circles around the Drush commands that we use to upgrade sites. Now, that's, I'm just talking about update, like, you know, running update PHP. Are you talking about upgrade, like, no, major uh, versions? Yeah, major versions. Six version. to seven? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't touch it because it's, I didn't <laughs> talk about it because it's, a, it's a, a tricky and in-depth conversation. Yeah. But you want to look at, you want to look at the migrate module. Yeah. Uh, the migrate D to D. Uh, which is an extension of the migrate module, which is, uh, will allow you to write migrations to move your Drupal 6 sites into Drupal 7. So We're using that as part of the site consolidation. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, because we, we have a similar setup where we have a central uh, service that supports multiple sites, and do you just leave it to the site owner to do the, the up upgrade, or that's something you guys do for them? We're doing it. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Julianne Chapman, University of Illinois. Um, I was curious about what your group makeup is in terms of size and skill sets. What, what makeup? Let us know how big our group is. Our group, stand up. We, uh, most of them are right here. <laughs> the Drupal team is right here. Uh, we have a few other uh, people working on uh, custom applications. So, uh, how many people do we have, Matt? Well, Central Web. Central Web. We have our project manager. Yeah. The, you know, there, there's. About eight of us, I guess, but just, just really four or five of us working on Drupal. Within Central Web, we have other developers. Manuel stood up here. He's in one of the colleges, and we have people out in the colleges that are doing Drupal. So, you know, all in all, at Oregon State University, I'm sure there's 20 or more people working, working on Drupal. Okay, so is your group mostly just developers, or do you include ops and design all the way through the chain? Yeah, so yeah, we, we are developers. We maintain the back-end infrastructure. We maintain the distribution. Uh, you know, we, we help people build their sites. We do the training. We do user support. We do everything but, you know, well, we, we hold their hands too, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We pretty much do all that. 
Hi, my name is Tanu. Um, my team actually automated the continuous integration process for government, and one of the key requirements we had was integrating application security testing, and I was curious if you had to do the same thing if you did anything in the security space. Security testing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, we definitely rely on our, our network uh, group. You know, we're, we're part of the bigger information uh, services organization. We have, a, uh, you know, other people that handle the firewalls and the um, networking layer. So we've been pretty much isolated from that that doesn't mean that when we deploy applications we we you know we still have to address the security issues within our own applications and Drupal is one of those we have to make sure that you know we're handling the site permissions accordingly and if we have any sensitive data in there to make sure that that's stored in a secured way when we're writing uh, forms and whatnot, we have to protect against SQL index. And so most of our responsibility is, ha is happening at the uh, development end of it, not the network end. Okay, thanks. Hi, so it looks like you're using sites and sub-sites currently for your departments and schools. When you're moving to organic groups, are you doing any sort of hierarchy? Like, are you having sub-sites or sub-departments inside? Well, what and we which modules are you using to accomplish that? Well, what we discovered about organic groups is, uh, by default, it's a flat uh, structure. They, right. they don't allow you to create hierarchical uh, group structure. Uh, so we developed around that and just created uh, a kind of a, a, a second layer. Uh, we call it parent unit. And it, we just created a content type, called it parent unit, and used a entity reference so that we could associate a bunch of groups with a parent unit. And that was a pretty simple thing to do that, that met our needs, at least so far. If it, if it had to uh, scale down to more, higher, more of a hierarchical structure, we would have to be looking towards something else. I believe that, uh, didn't you say somebody's working on a module to there, do that? There's a module. Yeah, it, yeah. So that that's an issue that needs to be addressed within organic groups. Yes. Right. Thank you. Do you have a solution for that? No, I'm looking for one. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Matt Garrett, University of Kansas. I noticed in your uh, install user script that you guys created, you have an insert into CAS user. Are you guys using CAS for? Central yes, we're using CAS. I'm sorry, I skipped over that. That's all right. Um, the, so what that script actually just did was insert uh, the CAS username when people log in, well, well, the install profile when it's creating the uh, users, the install script when it's creating the users, uses our, our network identity. We call it own it, Oregon network ID. And, and so, and that's the CAS username. So that script just stuck that in the uh, CAS user table uh, so that then after that, the CAS login would work for them. Are but CAS is an excellent way to do single sign-on for, for large Drupal installation, absolutely. If you are you using it. a specific module for that, or are you, is that something custom created? We're using the CAS module okay. right out of the box. Okay, cool, thanks. And it, it, which just leverages the CAS PHP library, which you know, is uh, supposedly uh, one of the best things around for, for in the CAS world. So. Hi, Daniel from the UO. I have a question about the themes. So you have a couple of themes. Do you have a lot of flexible features given to the user, or do you allow even sub-theming from other groups, or it's in your team only? The theme? So um, we, we work with our web communications people that have the designers. And initially, we started out <clears throat> in our, our older Drupal 6 themes, we sub-themed Zen. We started with the Zen theme. We sub-themed it. And we were creating individual themes for each college. We were kind of branding them so they looked a lot the same. And we had some common features. Uh, moving to Drupal 7, we created a single theme basing it on uh, Twitter Bootstrap. We created the theme from scratch. And we've built in a process of what we call theme variants, which is simpler than sub-theming. Because basically, all you do is add in uh, a style sheet. 
and link that in, and that gives you some, uh, you know, some variance. So we still have to create all those. Uh, we haven't uh, turned it over to the departments and the sites and say you create your own themes. Uh, you know, we're we're not doing that. We're we're maintaining the branding uh, from the top down, mostly coming out of web communications. Okay. Thank you. Stephanie Bridges, Iowa State University. Um, I was going to ask about the CAS users, but I guess that already got answered. Um, my other question was, how much customization do you allow individual clients since you've got such a large scale, and do you allow them to do their own customizations? Well, it depends. You know, <laughs> uh, Like I just answered, with the theming, we keep that to quite the minimum. If they go through web communications and those people want to give them a little branding something, then we build that in. Other than that, they, they can't do that on their own. As far as developing features for their site, we're working with people in the departments that do that. Our graduate college uh, went and hired a Drupal developer, so they can create their own modules. And uh, we're working with them to uh, you know, get those modules in our repository, trying to make sure that they're developed uh, in a fashion that's going to be uh, compatible with our distribution. And so we do, we do want to encourage that. Mostly, you know, we found that uh, people would like to do a lot of different things, but they don't really have the resources to do it, and they depend on us. And in some cases, people, uh, you know, ask us to write custom applications within Drupal, and, and, and we do that as well in-house. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. We don't let our users do anything, so yeah. we do it all for them. <laughs> well, we didn't either, but you know what? That that doesn't create a good feeling. You know, it, you, you got to work with them and give them some feeling that you know they're building their websites. That you know, it's it's somehow personal to them. If you for some of, some of our users have trouble mastering the uh, exactly. WYSIWYG editor, so and that's they're happy the way to most ask of them are. So you know, those people fine. You just train them and and hope they do their best. <laughs> Hi, I'm David Bass from Western Washington University. Uh, I was curious about regarding the uh, lowest common denominator problem. If something like uh